Thank you, Samir. Um, it says that I have no conflict of interest. I actually have one. I'm an, one of the associate editors of Intensive Care Medicine, so I will try to convince you that this is actually the best journal for our uh, profession and that you should definitely submit your work uh, with us, in particular about neuro, of course, which is the most exciting field in critical care. Um, I had to make a personal selection. So uh, it's like being in a chocolate shop. I will show you and make you taste a couple of chocolates and then put them in a box and so you can uh, taste them uh, at home uh, as well. Um, I will show you a lot of papers. So uh, you see that different editors had different approaches. Some made a small selection. I will show you a lot of papers so you, you only get a small taste of it um, to, uh, to, to read them, uh, the ones that interest you. And actually, uh, initiatives like this, like Synapse ICU, are hugely important for us because they learn us in fields where there's low level of evidence what practice is. And so this is uh, a, a large uh, uh, observational cohort where they looked at tier, uh, uh, the different tier level therapies in uh, traumatic uh, brain injury and non-traumatic uh, injuries such, such as interest, cerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it actually showed that the initiation of uh, these tier three uh, therapies usually happens early and that the ones that are on tier three uh, therapy will usually um, continue that for at least a week. When it comes to outcome, of course, the, the data are biased because you will see that the extreme till is associated with, uh, with actually with non-applying extreme till is associated with worse survival, which would sound strange, but that is, of course, selection uh, by the physicians that those patients with no chance of a good outcome are not selected for this uh, therapy. Phenotyping our uh, uh, TBI patients is an important thing, and it's, uh, it's something that comes back here in many lectures that actually the Glasgow Coma Scale is not the best way to phenotype. And there's actually uh, data-driven approaches as proposed in this, uh, in, in this uh, paper that, <coughs> that have looked at different studies that have proposed other ways to phenotype traumatic brain injury um, uh, patients, and it could be promising to use these uh, uh, phenotypes for future clinical trials. Um, but these large databases can also learn us something about the physiology and about how we treat patients. And this is a very interesting study where they uh, looked at the data from Center TBI, which is a huge data repository, but also OZ Enter TBI, which is a smaller uh, um, uh, data set, and they looked at oxygen. And it's actually shown that, and this is not the first time that this is shown, that the extremes of admission PIO2 are associated with worse outcomes. So not only hypoxia, but also hyperoxia is associated with uh, worse outcomes. So they, they looked at uh, centers in, um, in Australia as well as in, in Europe. They looked at PIO2 as well as FIO2, and it was shown that the, high, the highest maximum PO2, the highest average PO2, but also the variation in PO2 was associated with six-month mortality and six-month Glasgow outcome score. And this led to a discussion, which often happens in our journal, if you have these papers, that there's a discussion, and we try to uh, to, to encourage that and publish these discussion papers. So if you want to react on a paper, please uh, send us that reaction because it can, it can, can have uh, an interesting discussion. And actually, it's true that we should consider oxygen as a drug like any other thing that we do. It's not something that we apply and we don't have to look at it and we don't have to worry about it. It is a drug that needs careful uh, dosage. Um, and also in the CIBIC, also published in our journal, in CIBIC guidelines, there is a sort of a maximum or an optimal PO2 that is set at 120 uh, millimeters of mercury. Now, there's not only O2, there's also CO2. And in the past, there's been a lot of discussion of what the optimal uh, CO2 level, especially also in the pre-hospital phase, uh, could be. And this is a very interesting prospective trial from the Dutch Helicopter Emergency Medicine Service, where they have looked at the pre-hospital PAO2, so the, uh, the end tidal uh, CO2 values in their helicopters, to see whether there was an optimum value, and they were actually able to find that there was a J-shaped relationship uh, where hyperventilation as well as 
uh, hypoventilation are associated with worse outcome, and they actually set the thresholds um, five millimeters of mercury higher than what is currently recommended. So this is definitely a paper that might lead to a change in um, outcome. When it comes to neuro papers, there's also uh, pathophysiological uh, papers that we publish, and this is a, a great paper. And look at the amazing graphs that our illustrators are able to come up with. And this is the previous studies that I cited you are mainly about oxygen delivery, but it's, of course, oxygen does not only get to be delivered to the brain, it needs to diffuse to the brain and then needs to be used by the brain. So it doesn't uh, make sense, for instance, to uh, increase the PaO2 simply uh, by, uh, the, or increase brain tissue oxygen simply by increasing PaO2, you should make sure that that is utilized as well. And so the gap between PaO2 and PVTO2 might be an interesting parameter to look at in the future uh, as well. Um, ox oxygen transport, hemoglobin, and uh, the use of EPO uh, in, in, uh, in, in TBI. We know that uh, using EPO in, in TBI is negative. So the large uh, Lancet paper, the EPO TBI uh, uh, paper, was not able to show an improvement in functional outcome. Um, and uh, the pre-planned long-term follow-up, so six years after the injury, is now, uh, study, is now published in our uh, journal. And what you can see is actually that uh, overall, over the whole group, the, the mortality benefit that was shown in EPO-TBI, the, which the study was underpowered, is actually confirmed. Um, and that mainly in subgroups um, with uh, po polytrauma or a severe, uh, um, a high uh, abbreviated injury score, that there is a, a trend towards increased uh, survival. And this <coughs> data has been used to plan a new study uh, to see whether this 8% difference is, is actually true. And so the EPO-trauma trial is now being planned. And so this uh, sub-analysis has, has actually led to a new trial of um, 1,600 to 2,300 uh, patients. So quite interesting to see over the next years um, where this uh, will go to. Sometimes a negative trial can also learn us something. TOPAR trial, an anti-malaria drug, but also anti-inflammatory, was hypothesized that it would, uh, that it would reduce um, organ dysfunction in a massive hemorrhage, and unfortunately it did not, but also a well-conducted uh, well trial can also learn you something also when, uh, when the trial is uh, negative. Now, this trial was, uh, has, has, has raised some controversy in, uh, in the community and in the journal as well. This is a Chinese trial where they did right medium nerve stimulation in, uh, 100, uh, in 329 adult TBI patients, half of them right medium nerve stimulation and half of them they had a sham uh, stimulation and they looked whether uh, this intervention would lead to a higher proportion of patients recovering uh, from coma. And what you would not suspect, at least I would not have suspected, but there was indeed a uh, quite uh, pronounced um, higher rate of recovery um, across different subgroups by the intervention. Now, of course, this is a first proof of concept uh, trial and was highly criticized um, in this uh, opinion paper because the study is, of course, unblinded. Um, the, not all clinical data have been reported. The size effect is quite large and maybe implausible uh, to have. Um, maybe the cohort is not representative for other cohorts that we see. And the authors of this discussion uh, part also thought that uh, uh, mechanism was uh, not plausible. But still, there was a reply by the authors. Look, it is indeed a pragmatic trial with shortcomings and that needs uh, confirmation, and I'm sure and hope that other groups will uh, confirm these findings later. Neuro is not only about brain injury. Neuro is also about uh, brain dysfunction, and other conditions can lead to brain dysfunction as well. And we know that ICU delirium can have many uh, long-term outcomes, as uh, clear from this uh, nice uh, review paper. Um, when treating um, uh, delirium. I think we are less certain about the treatments that we uh, need to give. This is a secondary Bayesian analysis of the ADICU trial, a large, uh, a large trial uh, published in the New England 
<laughs> that with frequent statistics um, have shown an improved mortality uh, but no, um, uh, in, uh, by giving halo, haloperidol. And actually this uh, Bayesian analysis confirmed the results of the uh, initial, uh, uh, initial uh, uh, study. The advantage of Bayesian analysis is, of course, that for a clinician it gives you a more intuitive interpretation um, of, the, of, the, um, of the results. Volatile anesthetics, can we use them? Um, uh, well, we, we are using them more and more. It is feasible to use them, um, even, um, even uh, in complex RDS, ARDS, as we have seen uh, in, in the COVID. Um, there are some drawbacks uh, of the technique, but none of them that, uh, are, uh, cannot be overcome. Although we should, of course, pay attention that if we use volatile anesthetic, that our patient might react differently than uh, the IV um, uh, um, anesthetics that we're used to uh, use. For instance, compared to uh, propofol, you see more fever, more rapid temperature increases, so a different dynamics of the temperature, may, probably because isoflurane um, uh, it will impact the ter uh, termito regulatory response to a lesser degree. And then my last slide, and I'm right on time, um, about um, uh, uh, brain death determination, because indeed, unfortunately, sometimes we are not successful, and some of our patients will end up uh, brain dead in the ICU. And as you can see, this is a very nice uh, overview on the use of ancillary testing, which we should choose not to use. We should mainly rely on clinical examination for brain death and only use ancillary testing if we uh, are unsure or if the circumstances don't allow for uh, brain net testing. And with that, I would like to end my talk. <laughs> Thank you very much for this great presentation, Geert. At this time, we have no question on the chat. Maybe some question with, uh, for uh, Geert? So what's your recommendation now for the objective of uh, the temperature after cardiac arrest of CO2 level, according uh, uh, the recent data, for all patients and for some selected patients in trauma? Do you have the answer of this? So, um, so the study that I quoted is about pre-hospital and tidal <laughs> CO2. And I think the main message here is in the pre-hospital setting, when you're not sure, I think normal ventilation should be your goal. And I think this, the trial that I showed you in, in TBI was about, actually shifted the, 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 the previous recommendation with five millimeters of mercury higher, which is nice. Of course, sometimes in the pre-hospital setting, you can already have some patients with uh, pending herniation, with impending herniation, with maybe already a trend or uh, unequal pupils. And I think in those patients, you could uh, consider temporary hyperventilation while you transport them to the hospital and then try to solve the problem, do a CT and see what's actually happening. Thank you, Gert. No more. Because the problem in, in the pre-hospital emergency department, etc., is the ventilator. The ventilator is not sometimes very efficient. Yeah. So we the, the physician always wants to make a little hyperventilation, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. so it may explain sometimes but, but some hyper... What it actually shows, and what maybe not all settings do, but is, what is quite easy to do, is to measure entitled CO2. I think that may be the main message of that paper. We should measure entitled CO2 in this pre-hospital setting, which is quite easy to do. Just put a capnograph in your ambulance and, uh, and measure. So do you think there will be... Um... Um, a future for medium nerve stimulation? Yeah, it's, well, it's interesting. I think, I think as a concept, it's interesting. It's, of course, provocative. And I, I, I think the size effect is way too large to be credible, right? But um, t t there other types of stimulating the brain have been shown to, uh, like the studies by the group of Jan Klaassen in, in New York, brain stimulation can increase the chance of recovering. So I think repeating this study 
uh, maybe on both sides stimulating the brain, doing EEG at the same time and looking, trying to explain the story because we have no explanation why this would work. I think that that is the future of coma science. And there's a large initiative by the Neurocritical Care Society also involving the European Society, which is the Curing Coma campaign and researching, um, uh, I mean, better phenotyping of coma, trying to detect those patients where there is a signal of maybe hope and then trying to find uh, the appropriate stimulus or diagnostic test in these patients, I think is going to be the challenge of the next decades. Just get to understand well, it's not something opposite to have a patient in coma and to stimulate it because the coma is artificial coma, it's coma under sedation. Well, that is something that these authors have failed to disclose. Um, that is how many of and how their patients were sedated during stimulation or not. They say, I mean, they haven't disclosed the data. They just claimed that most of them were no longer sedated because it was an intervention that was after day seven. But we don't have the data. Uh, but normally we assume that they were not sedated. Again, thank you very much. Uh, yep.